Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to see you this morning. You guys doing all right? Good, good. Hey, uh, Kyle's, uh, he's not going to toot his own horn, but he's actually the dean this week. So please be in prayer for him all week long. Uh, though it's going to be very hot, it's also going to get very cold. At night, it's going to be in the upper 50s later on in the week. So moms, uh, prepare your campers, okay, for that. Hey, uh, I want to say welcome to all of our guests. We're honored that you're with us today. It's just, it truly is our privilege. I, I, some of you might remember I told you about this pet store delivery guy. He was uh, driving a truck, and he would go to all the pet stores in the area and deliver them their goods. And, um, but particularly on this day, at every stop, he was stopping at the, at the light. The driver would jump out. He'd grab this two-by-four, and he ran to the back of the truck. He'd just start beating on the side of the truck. Well, nobody came up to him and said anything until this one guy was just right next to him. There's two guys in a car, and they looked over, and as he came back, he said, man, what are you doing beating on the side of your truck like that? He said, well, this is only a two-ton truck, and I got four tons of canaries in there, so I keep two tons up in the air all the time. Yeah, you ever feel that way? Is that how your week's been going? <clears throat> Well, welcome to our week number uh, 28 in our study, Quest 52. We're looking at 52 weeks of pursuing Jesus, getting to know Jesus uh, better. And we're in the section where we're learning about Jesus' teaching, um, where he uh, last week opened up this section, these uh, 13 weeks, with uh, the message uh, letting people know what he was here for, what he was going to do. So he starts out by quoting then the prophecy from the Old Testament where Jesus said about himself, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now remember that good news to the poor part because as he, we're going to look at his most famous sermon of all, covers three chapters in Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, we won't have time to do all of that, of course, unless you guys want to stay a while. But no, I'm just gonna, we're just going to look at the Beatitudes, the very beginning of that. But uh, uh, it begins with, uh, blessed are the poor. So notice Jesus says here that the prophecy said, Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and pro to proclaim the years of the Lord's favor. And so in this three-chapter-long declaration, Jesus is going to say, this is what living in the kingdom is going to be about. Now, he's not going to make it possible yet. He has his whole ministry to do, so this is right at the beginning. But this is kind of his overture. This is what I'm going to be about. So in the Beatitudes, he's setting up, this is what the gospel is about. If you don't get this first section right, the Beatitudes, then the rest of this, you're not going to be able to, uh, to do those anyway. These are attitudes that I want you to have so that you could be blessed, the be attitudes, the be attitudes, have these attitudes in you, so you will be blessable. Because how many of you know God wants to bless people? He wants to bless them, but he's not going to bless everybody. He wants to bless those that position themselves to be blessable. So I hope you see that Jesus is laying out these building blocks for his gospel. Now, the eight Beatitudes are not uh, one-shot deals. They're not just, you know, uh, if you do this when you get this. That's not what it's about. You'll see in a moment. It's a progression of the Christian life that Jesus is laying out uh, in, in this Sermon on the Mount. And if you don't see it as this progression of how you enter the kingdom and then live out the kingdom, if you see the rest of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you're going to see you can't keep it. We can't. This is too big of a burden. Let me give you an example. Uh, in a little bit, Jesus will say, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. How, how are we going to live up to that? Verse 28 in chapter 5 says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. How are we going to do that? Men and women. How are we going to do that? Verse 44, this is still just in the fifth chapter. You know, remember, he's got five, six, and seven. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If this is what we have to aspire to, you know, and, and be accountable for that, we're in, we're in trouble. So before you aim for that and repeatedly fall short, Jesus first teaches the good news, the gospel, and the Beatitudes. These are the blessings that will take care of your sin problem. That's really what I'm here all about. First, your sin problem. Then you will be empowered for living toward these kingdom values. You won't be able to do them all. We're still sinners. But you will be empowered to live towards these kingdom values. So let's grab your scriptures, if you would. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. 
Uh, we're beginning with that very first verse, or call up your, your phone to, to your Bible app. Matthew 5 and verse 1 begins this way. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Now, don't, don't, don't picture this. The, <clears throat> the crowds are out there. They can't hear him. And his you know, disciples come up close to hear him. No, the disciples take the role of a disciple and they're sitting at the rabbi's feet. But the rest of the crowd, this is an amphitheater. This is, he's up on the mountainside, the crowds are below him. And so he's teaching these crowds. Later on at the end of the sermon, it'll say, it'll, 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 Matthew records that the crowds were amazed that Jesus taught with authority. So they were listening to him. So here's how you can be blessable, Jesus is going to say. He starts to list in these eight blessable attitudes. He start, starts by saying this in verse 2. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean poor, be poor in spirit? It doesn't mean physical poverty at all. He doesn't say blessed are the poor. He, he says blessed are the poor in spirit. So he's not talking about economic poverty, material poverty, physical poverty. That's why they're not individual blessings because, you know, we all know that physical, uh, physical poverty is not a blessing. It's a burden. I mean, it's exhausting. Jesus is talking about a spiritual poverty, living with this awareness. Everybody say awareness. It's living with this awareness <clears throat> because not everyone is aware that you and I are spiritually accountable for our estrangement from God, our estrangement from God, that you'll be blessed when you realize the day you, you, you and I, when we do business in this area of our estrangement from God, that we'll be blessed in that. So consequently, being poor in spirit means first, there's only going to be two of these. First, I depend on Jesus to pay for my sins. I depend on Jesus to pay for my sins. And everybody say sins. Sins. I mean, that's the only time you're going to say it. We don't talk about sins in this, in this day and age. Uh, you feel guilty saying that out in public. You know, nobody wants to even talk about sin anymore. But we need Jesus to pay for our sins. And I pray that you know this. That, that without Jesus, you and I have to pay for our sin. We have to do it without, it, it, unless Jesus does it. So this separates Jesus and Christianity from all other false religions of the world. All the other religions of the world are built on this idea that you try hard enough, you do these things. If you get yourself your life together, or if you're nice enough, or you're generous enough to those in need, or that you worship, you know, every so often, that you'll be okay with God. And God will be okay with you. Because what? Well, you, you're above average. You're better than all the other ones that, that aren't doing this. Uh, you're going to do more good than bad because you're working at that. The good's going to outweigh the bad, they believe, and you're going to be okay. But that's a delusional fairy tale. It's just not true. You know, even the churches in the New Testament, um, people in the church had difficulty with, with this thought, bringing these other false religions in. Because Jesus had to address them, uh, and it's recorded in Revelation chapter 3. And he's, he's speaking to a church right there in Laodicea, but he's also referring to any church worldwide, even to us today, where he says this, Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. And you're talking about, you know, I mean, Americans, you know, we're, we're way up there in that 1% of the world or of, of all time. All of us, even the least among us when it comes to, uh, to money, that we're rich then. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But Jesus says, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. White clothes that you would wear so you could cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. I know you go to church sometimes, Jesus is saying, and I know you give sometimes when you feel like it, and I know you're nice and on and on. You know uh, my problem is you're, not, you're neither hot nor cold spiritually, he says. He says, I, I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, when, when, when you look in the mirror, you, you see, well, I'm good. I, I'm educated. I got money. I'm on my way to heaven. I got everything I need. I don't need a thing. 
But Jesus says, when I look at you, do you not realize that you're spiritually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked on your own? Jesus, he isn't playing. And so my highest hope for you today is that when you walk out of this service, that you realize how spiritually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked we all are without Jesus. Friends, your sins are going to be paid for. My sins are going to be paid for. Surely you know that, right? That your sins are not going to be forgiven because you're, you're sorry. Please forgive me, God. I didn't mean it. It was an accident. No, your sin, my sin, it's going to be paid for. It's going to be paid for in full. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. I remember Jesus is launching his ministry. He hasn't done everything yet to get all this done. But Paul's on the other side of it, so, you know, we are too, so we know. We know that Jesus will do the things to make this uh, take place in Romans chapter 3, but that's yet to come in their lives. But in Romans chapter 3, we're told this, we have that vantage point, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then because of Christ, all are justified freely by God's grace through redemption. He bought us back then that came by Christ Jesus that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, that you might become at one with God, atonement, at one with God, through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, he left the sins committed before unpunished. Remember, if you gave him the sacrifices of the animals. Well, it didn't really pay for the sin. It just left them unpunished and rolling them up to the time when Jesus, a perfect sacrifice, who was a human, just like you and I, could actually serve out that uh, penalty. Verse 26, Jesus did it to demonstrate, or God did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies, meaning that he's the judge, it's his universe, and he's making a right judgment here because of what Christ has done on our behalf. He justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So every single one of us, every one of us, in and of ourselves, have fallen short. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked on our own. Look again at Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin, we, our sin has earned us then death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Preacher, pretty harsh this morning, man. Well, I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm trying to help you. Your sins are going to be paid for. Somebody's going to pay that bill that you and I have earned. And, and, and you're saying, I'm sorry. It's not going to be paid for. Showing up at church, you know, every now and then, trying to ante up spiritually when you feel that you need it. It's not going to pay that bill. Your sins have a bill the cost is death. That's why it says the wages of sin is death. But, but, everybody say but. But, that's the biggest little word in the Bible right there, isn't it? But, the wages of sin is death. But, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Anybody want to say thank you, Jesus? Wow. See, when you see Jesus for who he is, and you see yourself for who you are, and then you put your faith in Jesus. You humble yourself before him like Peter. Remember when Peter fell down on that shore? And he fell at Jesus' knees, we're told. And he said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I need help. You see, the good news, the gospel is that Jesus' death on the cross can pay the bill for your sin when you give your life over to Jesus. He'll give you then on top of that eternal life because you've given your life over to him. You put your faith in him. And you know, you know some, so many people think that God's going to throw people in the hell because he's mad. I mean, that's what they think. That's what our society thinks. God, God, God's mad. I don't like that kind of God, so I don't have nothing to do with him. God's not mad at you. He's concerned for you. That's why he sent his only son to die in your place, to pay your bill, your penalty. The truth is your sin is so bad, Jesus had to pay your sin debt, and yet he loves you so much, he's glad to do it. God doesn't send people to hell because he's mad. People choose to go there because that's where sins are paid for if Jesus doesn't pay them in your place. Hell is the place where people go to pay their own sin debt. Why? Because they refuse to submit themselves to the only one in the universe who could actually pay that debt off for them. 
So not everyone's going to receive this gift, only the ones who put their faith in Jesus. Look how Apostle Paul would explain this in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead. Remember in the garden, as soon as you would sin, God said, dying you will die. You're on your way to death, physically, but you're already dead on your way. As for you, you, are, you were dead. Everybody say dead. Dead in your transgressions and sins, which you used to live, because he's writing to Christians, you know. He said, we used, to, we used to live that way when you followed the ways of this world. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. All of us, at one time or another, putting, gratifying ourselves, putting ourselves above God, following our desires rather than God's desires. And just like the rest of them, it's a choice deserving of wrath. Verse 4, though, but, everybody say but, but, because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy. So you think God's mad? No, he loves you. Mercy means you deserve it, but you're not going to get all that you deserve. Thank goodness. Verse 5 goes on to say, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. You know what this means? You, you, know, you know, mercy means you don't get all you deserve. Grace means you get loaded up with stuff. You get your socks blessed off, right? Bless your socks off. You didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. You know, you didn't earn it. Um, you never will because God loves you so much. He's so gracious. And wow, it's by grace that you've been saved. So when you and I, when we're poor in spirit, in our spirit, you know, spiritually, when we realize we've incurred this sin debt, it must be paid off that you can't pay it yourself. And then Jesus steps into your life. He takes the bullet for you. Remember last night, those Secret Service agents that were willing to take a bullet for, for President Trump? So, I mean, they're covering, they're going to take that bullet. Now, Jesus not only would take a bullet for you, he did. He did take that bullet for you, that punishment. Jesus paid your bill. And man, when you realize that, when that becomes real in your head and in your heart, your attitude then changes. Blessed are you when God opens your eyes, salves, gives you salve for your eyes so that you can see your life for what it really is. You realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Blessed are you because now you're within the grasp of salvation. You're not there yet. You're just realizing your need. Just as close to you. Now, these beatitudes are linked together. So when you get to the place where you realize the poverty of your spirit, then verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, again, if we think this is some individual circumstance, it make any sense. Happy are you when you cry. It doesn't make sense. That's not what it is. Jesus is talking about here. Blessed are you when on your soul level you don't just mourn that you got busted. You mourn because you are busted. That we're busted. You know, what, what are we going to do? God, for, you know, you begin to see God for who he really is. We, we, we begin to see that our own selfishness, our own ego, our own insecurity, and, and we see all this and we say, what's wrong with me? You begin to see how your sin and your sinfulness have separated. It's impacted your relationship with God and, and with others. And so you mourn about it. Blessed are you when you mourn. Why? Because you will, you will be comforted. Mourning is when the Spirit of God convicts you of your sin. You begin to realize wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. And you think, oh no, what do I do now? Which Jesus says, you're about to be comforted. You're about to be comforted. It leads on to the next one. Verse 5, blessed are the meek for they will inherit in the earth. Now, meek is not weak at all. Don't think weak when, uh, uh, for this word, meek. In, in, in the Greek, the word meek it actually refers to that bit that's placed in a horse's mouth. And so you, you see that, that it's this idea of being controlled or it's a directed strength. You see, meekness is when this powerful, thoroughbred horse, you know, with all its power and its strength, gives its control over to its master when it puts that little uh, bit then in its mouth. And so when the master says, goes left, he goes left then. When he says, go right, he goes right, you know, right. And so because 
when you get to the place when you're li- in your life, when you're spiritual bankrupt, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Blessed are you when you're convicted now of your sin. Blessed are you when you take the reins of your life and you say, God, I'm turning them over to you. I- I'm taking the bit and-, and I'm turning my life over to you. God, my way's not working. I'm going to put you in control of my life into your hands. That's what meekness is. Now, all together, then, what we've been talking about, Jesus talking about so far, that's what we would call later on in the New Testament repentance. Repentance. Blessed are you when you hand over the reins of your life into Jesus. I'm surrendering my life over to the Lordship of Christ. And you say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I confess that you're Lord. And so I surrender then to you. Now, this is the moment when a person turns from the life of sin and they turn now to the Lord, which is, then leads to the next one, number six. But verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus says, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and they thirst for right identity, not doing right things, but to have the right identity, to get my identity right again. Righteous means to have a right standing before God. You, you want to make things right with God. Hasn't happened yet in Jesus' ministry, okay? But after, uh, you know, he, he lays out his ministry, cha- uh, trains up his disciples, lets everything fall in place then. Jesus allows himself uh, to, to be crucified, so he, he has his death moment, He's buried then, his resurrection, teaches for 40 days then about the kingdom. Then he ascends then to the right hand of the Father. And as he promised when he gets there, God pours out the Holy Spirit onto the apostles. And they immediately start offering through the church now what God has done for us sinners in Jesus. To put into play now what God has done in Jesus for all who would receive it. And so Peter then explains all of this to them in that first sermon on that first first day, really, of, 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 the, of, of the new thing God is doing in the church. Verse 37 of Acts chapter 2 tells us, when the people heard this, they're cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We're, they're hungry now. They're thirsty. I want to do what's right. What should we do? And Peter tells them the gospel commands, just two commands, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Everybody say, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, he tells them. Peter does that first day. For all who are far off, it's going to go all around the world. For all whom our Lord, our God, will call. And the call still goes out today. Repent and be baptized. The gospel commands. Now notice, it doesn't say, ask Jesus into your heart. You don't see that anywhere in Scripture. It doesn't say, pray the prayer. It doesn't say that in Scripture. It doesn't say, raise your hand. Everybody, bow your heads, raise your hand. I see you there. I see you. I see you. Okay, now, uh, let me pray, and then if this is your prayer, then you're in. It doesn't say any of that. It doesn't say, you know, your parents can cover this. You don't have to do it. No, you see what we have to work up to get to this point, to repent? That's the first part of the command. The second part of the command, then, is this. It's be baptized. This is the entry point. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Two things will happen. This is how you enter then the kingdom. Your sins are forgiven. It's what Jesus is all about. Getting you you right with God then. Then as you are right, you got to continue to live on this earth. I want to empower you. I want to come live within you. Holy Spirit then is given to live within you. So the result of that hungering, that thirsting for that righteousness, you are filled, Jesus promises. You'll be satisfied now on, on, with this right relationship with God. You, you are filled then. Or you're satisfied before God. So blessed are you when you continuously then, you, you hunger, you thirst to deepen your relationship with Jesus. Because what has happened is that your soul now can be satisfied in a way that nothing on this planet could ever satisfy. So Jesus is just laying out the gospel here. That's his goal. So before I do all of this, Before I lay out for you now what right living is like in my kingdom, and hey, I'm stepping it up, Jesus says. I'm going for the intent of the heart, not just the the big ten commandments that my father sent you. I'm going to show you your real place, your real position, your real need for a savior, because he's going to take it up a notch. But first, we need to take care of your sin problem. 
So Jesus is just laying out the gospel here. That's the goal. Blessed are you when you're convicted of your sin. Blessed are you when you begin to mourn for not living God's way. Blessed are you when you turn over the reins of your life to God. Blessed are you when you get right with God, uh, repenting, being baptized, and you continuously deepen your walk with him. And now what's going to happen to you is you're going to begin to treat people differently because you're new. You're a different person. You're now empowered by the Holy Spirit that's living with you. So uh, having brought you into the kingdom now, sin's forgiven, Holy Spirit in you now, so you can be empowered by that Spirit. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So blessed are you when the mercy gets so on you that God gives you so much mercy, and you let that, that, uh, that conduit just continue to let it just spill out on everybody else. The forgiveness of God towards you is so overwhelming because you know you didn't deserve this. Uh, and when people sin against you, then you begin to show them that same kind of mercy. Blessed are you. Then he says, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, again, if this is individual blessing, how much percentage is pure? What cuts it for being pure in heart? Has anyone ever been pure in heart? Nobody can meet this but Jesus. So that's not what he's talking about. Something has to take place. Something has to happen for you and I to be blessable in a position that we're thought of as being pure in heart. It's a fulfillment of an Old Testament promise that God will do this. Look at Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. I will give you a new heart. God's going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Though I know you can't, but we took care of that problem. Paul would teach it then in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to the churches. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you got to get in me now, okay? Then you aspire to live in this new kingdom. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled to uh, us to himself, and he did it through Christ. Blessed are you in Christ Jesus, because we're going to see him one day, face to face. We, we're seeing him more, more and more now that, than we could ever before, but one day it'll be face to face, because we're in. We're in the kingdom. We just have to wait our arrival, and we're going to see Jesus. We're going to see God face to face one day. Which goes to the next link in the chain, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, there's a big difference between peacemaker and peacekeeper. Peacekeepers are, you know, parents, when you tell the one kid, you go to your room, you tell the other kid, you go to that room. Now we got peace. That's peacekeeping. But that's not what, what's going on here. We're talking about peacemaking here. Blessed are you when you make shalom happen. This, this bringing the fullness, this wholeness, uh, as you help other people be reconciled themselves to God. That, that they're, they're, they're reconciled now to God because you helped in that process. You, you're a peace, uh, peacemaker. God's using you to bring that peace. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18, Paul would continue on. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he, and he has committed to us the message or the ministry of reconciliation. We are, you are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors as though, not as though in English, that, that doesn't, no, it, it is you are, God is. God is making his appeal through you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then here, here's how that takes place. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us on the cross so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. There's that gospel. That's the goal of the kingdom of God. There's that great exchange. I give over, uh, you know, Jesus takes my sin, and then God takes Jesus' righteousness, and he gives it to me. I'm now right with God. I have become, you have become the righteousness of God. God making Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for you, so that in Jesus you can become the righteousness or right with God. Blessed 
are the peacemakers, Christ's ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So church, every time that you invite that one more, every time that you share then a good word from the Lord, every time you, you pray for someone else, that on behalf of Christ, God is making his appeal through you. So may we never stop sharing the gospel with the one mores that Jesus has placed in our lives. May we never stop trying to make peace between the enemies of God and God himself. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through you and I. Blessed are you when you realized that God loves you so much that he sent his son on a rescue mission for you. Blessed are you the moment you get rescued, and then you realize you are now on the rescue team. And then finally, the eighth uh, beatitude in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, it started off with the kingdom of heaven. It ends now with the kingdom of heaven. And following then, like commentary on verse 10, is verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. To be in that company of the prophets that have come before us that we look up to. But when you're persecuted, you're, you're making yourself blessable when you suffer then for the cause of Christ. Why? Well, because when you live in a world that's all about me, when we stand up for truth in a world that's, there's no such thing as truth. Your truth is your own truth. And self rules. We'll be persecuted. And Jesus said, don't be surprised about that. Look, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. See, we can't pull this off, you know, this life off on our own. Jesus did not come to make bad people better or sad people happy. He came to give life to the dead. He came to give salvation to us sinners. And so in a way, the Beatitudes are kind of like, you know, it starts out like the first of the Ten Commandments. God gave to Moses to give to God's people. If you're going to live, if you're going to be my people, if you're going you're to hang with me, this is what the kingdom needs to be like. This is what you are to aspire to. And so that very first command is, you shall have no other gods before me. And, and, and you know, if we, couldn't, if we can't get that one right, it doesn't matter what the rest of them are. And it's the same thing here, that, that if you can't get this first blessing that I'm to be poor in spirit. I'm to humbly depend on God's plan instead of my plan. Then, 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 then we miss it all. But there's more to this being poor in spirit. Because then secondly, then we got to depend on God's strength, not our own strength. We, we, we depend on God's plan in Jesus to pay for our sins. Now we depend on God's strength then to, to live a life for him. Psalm 84, 84 and verse 5 says this, you bless all. You, God, you bless all who depend on you for their strength. You depend on God for your strength, and he's going to bless you. As you're living in the kingdom of God, as you're on mission, that rescue mission with Jesus, then you need to, uh, to do this. You need to live then. Uh, you need to run on his strength, and he'll bless you. You know, people talk all about, you know, these situations that come in people's lives. And, you know, we say it to each other. People say it to us. Say, I don't know how people can make it without Jesus. You can't. And they can't. The ones you know that you love, they, they can't make it without Jesus. They need you to get them to Jesus. It doesn't have to be that way. If you and I, if they will humble themselves, be poor in our spirit, we then call out to God for our strength. I'm going to encourage you to memorize a, a verse, you know. I, I'll give you one today. There's so many, though. But, but how about Psalm 27 and verse 1, that, that when you run into difficulties, uh, when you're, you know, it, this, this kind of affirms my dependence on God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? See, it's an affirmation of our dependence that I'm poor in spirit. I'm going to rely on God. I'm not walking in my own strength. I can't do this kingdom of God thing in my own strength. 
I'm going to walk in the strength of the Lord. For those who are poor in spirit, you see, that's a good thing. So tomorrow, when you don't have enough energy, maybe to get up out of bed, I mean, you're feeling depressed, I mean, you're just worn out, the Lord is my strength. He's my light, my salvation, my fortress, protecting me from danger. When you get into conflict, something comes up, you're, you're just right in the middle of it. You're right up in the middle of all this, you know. Uh, the Lord is going to be my light. He's going to guide me. He's going he's to show my path to me. He's going to be my salvation. He's my fortress. When you're frustrated, you're scared, that anxiety is rising up within you, you begin to, to panic, then pray, the Lord is my light. Lord, you are my salvation and my strength. My fortress, protect me, Lord. See, that's the woman that God will bless. That's the kind of man that God will bless. Someone who walks in the strength of the Lord as they have humbled themselves and had Jesus pay for their debt, and now they walk in the kingdom in the strength of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, who are we that you would extend such a great love towards us? Father, we, we come before you all admitting we don't deserve the grace that you've lavished on us. It's only coming our way because of the love that you have and the sacrifice, Jesus, that you have for us. And so more than just being thankful, Lord, help us to live in that. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here today that hasn't uh, entered the kingdom yet, that, that they would have this, um, this hungering and a thirst within them, that they would mourn, that they would see their need for you and all that you have in store for them, that, it's just right, that they're right there at the door, that you would convict them by your spirit, that they may give your life, their life over to you. We pray, Lord, that as a church, as Pleasant Hill, this time, this place, and this society, this community you place us in, May we be found up for the task of being ambassadors for you. That you would work your mercy and grace through us as we reach out to others, as we help to rescue them, Lord. All of this, that Christ might be honored and glorified, that souls might be one to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Boy, Preacher was really bringing it this morning, wasn't he? Thanks, Dave. Uh, a couple questions this morning. Uh, quick show of hands, too, please. Raise your hand if you have ever walked beans before. Anybody walking beans? Yes, 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 yes. If you know, you know, right? Like, it's a lot. Guess what I did this week? Yeah, walk beans. If you know, you know. But if you don't know, the general idea is that you're physically walking through a boing, uh, soybean field, excuse me, with a garden hoe or weeding tool of choice, and you're basically removing anything that's not a soybean. And so uh, that was my week this week. It was hot. It was humid. I had mud caked to my boots, which I am grateful for the rain, by the way. Uh, it was all the things. It was, it was work, but it was necessary. I'll spare you the details and the pros and cons of growing non-GMO soybeans. But we had a mess on our hands of horse weeds. I don't know if you know what a horse weed is. Some people call it a giant ragweed. Whatever you want to call it, here's a couple fun facts. Number one, they are from the devil. <laughs> Look it up. It's Jesus' parable of the weeds after service, okay? <clears throat> Number two, they can grow up to 17 feet tall. And they grow fast. Number three, do you know how many seeds one, of the, one plant can produce? Five to 10,000. So you can see the sense of urgency uh, before these things go to seed, right? If I don't deal with these soon or get much taller because they can get I got a problem, right? Can you see where I'm going with this? Apostle Paul said, uh, everyone 
ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So, do we have any weeds that need dealt with? It's kind of funny about Paul's story. Before he was the Apostle Paul, he was kind of the self-righteous Saul, right? Smart guy, thought he had all the answers, had it all figured out. Then, figuratively speaking, Christ knocked him off his high horse and blinded him for a few days, right? That's another good story to check out. But one final thought before we'll share in communion together, and this one, this question has been working on me lately, is, well, let me backtrack. Maybe it's not a weed that's an issue in your life in this season. But the question is, am I becoming more loving? Am I becoming more loving? That's a very interesting question. Because instead of pulling weeds, now we're talking about yield or results or spiritual fruit. Am I becoming more loving? Would you pray with me? Uh, Father God, thank you for your deep, deep love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Thank you for this church and this community of believers of your son, Jesus. Lord, help us to see what we cannot. Uh, help us to keep our eyes on you as you lead us through each and every day. And in this moment, would you meet us where we are and help us to deal with our sin nature, our weeds, so that we can better serve you by showing your love to those around us. Help us be a light in this dark world. Would your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.